Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today in my series on AP English, a course that I'll be teaching in the fall, I have yet another definition of poetry. Now, if you've been watching these videos, you know that I had offered one, which is offered by Professor Burton Raphael, and this is probably the most canonized and anthologized book on how to read a poem. But today I'll talk about how Perry Eagleton defines poetry in his similarly titled book, How to Read a Poem. Now, Eagleton, if you're not aware, is a British scholar. He's a Marxist and famous for a lot of work, but most importantly, his book, An Introduction to Literary Theory, which a lot of the professors still use and find useful. So the way Eagleton defines poetry is a, a sort of a really interesting but mundane definition on the first utterance, and I'll read it out and put it on the screen as well. A poem is a fictional, verbally invented moral statement in which it is the author rather than the printer or word processor who decides where the lines should end. That's Eagleton's definition of poetry. A poem is a fictional, verbally inventive moral statement in which it is the author rather than the printer or word processor who decides where lines should end. So let's look at the constitu constituent parts of this definition. It is fictional. Now, he, in chapter two of his book, he goes and explains each of these qualifiers for what constitutes being a poem. So by fictional, what he means, and you can read it more carefully, is that most of the times as you read a poem and you read about a character, you are not likely to assume that this is a real life character and these are empirical real life events. The poet creates a persona, creates a situation, right? And that is the fictional aspect of a poem and most of the times in poetry it will have that fictional element. Now, for example, if you have read Browning's My Lost Duchess, as you read the poem, the character of uh, the Duke and our visitor to whom it's a, you know, it's a, it's a monologue, so we just hear the Duke speaking. One could think that th that really maybe happened, but most of the time we read it as a fictional narrative and we also don't read it as if the, the voice that's coming, the narrator is the poet. So that's the fictional aspect of the poem. The first part of it, the inventive part or the, the ending of the lines, that's really crucial. It sounds very simple, but remember, in prose, lines keep going and the only restraint on them is where one line ends on a page and we move to the next one. In poetry, where a line ends is intentional. The poet decides where one verse will end or one line of a verse would end and the second one will decide and that is what also clearly differentiates poetry from prose. But what Eagleton is saying is that there is a logic behind it. There are reasons behind it, the meter, the rhythm, or whatever the poet wants to say in a given poem decides the length of the line. And that distinctly makes poetry different from prose, that inten intentional breaking of a line, right? And that's not done because of restraints of printing or PDF, but rather because the poet decides it. Now, another aspect of the definition is that it's a moral statement. 
Now, and Eagleton, of course, discusses what he means by morality, but by morality, he doesn't mean that a poem tells us what is right and what is wrong and what is just and what is unjust, but rather it speaks of human values, you know, love, empathy, care, hate. So a poem always has some kind of a moral content which deals with human values and human lives, not judgments, not religious sentiment alone, but care of others, thinking of human life, death, love. That is the moral aspect of a poem. Then poetry as a fiction, I briefly talked about that most of the times when we read a poem, we don't assume that it's empirical or it's true or it's based in real life events. Even historical poems have a fictional element to that. So that one element is also added to the definition of the poetry. And then there is another part of it which he calls poetry and pragmatism. Now this, if you have read his uh, introduction to literary theory, there while defining literature, he goes to scholars who believe that one aspect of the literary is that it's non-programmatic language. The idea behind it is that it's non-pragmatic language is that poetry, good poetry, doesn't try to accomplish something by itself. It just is that it's impractical. It's not there to teach you how to build a brick oven or how to it has no utilitarian, pragmatic purpose. You know, it's the aesthetics of the poetry itself that are supposed to please you and maybe make you think about the world differently. So we have one that the lines don't end arbitrarily, that most of the times what's worked through in a poem is fictional, that it has non-pragmatic language, that it doesn't have a purpose. It's not purposive in that sense. And then, most importantly, is after we've dealt with morality, that it will have a moral message, not a judgmental moral message, but rather dealing with human existence and human aspects. And then is the most important one is that it has, it uses poetic language. Right? Uh, it uses language in a special way by use of metaphor, simile, right? metonymy. But also the way the world order in a poem is different from how it would be in the, pro you know, in prose. And that special, which used to be called poetic diction, and I'll have some more videos on it, but that also is a constitutive part of poet. So let's go back to his definition. A poem is a fictional, verbally inventive, that's where the poetic language would come in. Moral statement, the question of values or feelings or human life, in which it is the author rather than the printer or word processor who decides where the lines should end. So, a really not a very, on the first instance, it doesn't come across a very sophisticated definition. But if you really think about it, all poems follow a certain pattern, a certain style. All lines end because the poets decided where to end the line. Majority of poems have a moral purpose or a moral message about human life, they deal with human life, and they deal with it imaginatively in a fictional way. Most of the lyrical poems at least have no stated purpose. They don't want to change the world. They have no pragmatics involved in them, right? They just are verbal expressions of thoughts and ideas. And that takes us to the inventiveness part, and that is that poetry uses specialized language and uses language in a specialized way. So this is yet another brief description or definition of what is poetry by another scholar, 
and you can read the chapter i'll see if i can copy it and upload it to my website and provide a link here but now you have two definitions of poetry one by burton Raphael and the other one by terry, terry eagleton there are similarities between the two at least especially about the poetic language now keep this in mind and as you read poetry at least this little bit of knowledge would help you have a sense of how people have tried to define poetry. Now please remember this is humanistic education. In humanistic educations we, we talk about values and we talk about form and content. But unlike sciences and hard sciences, there are no precise, perfect, single ways of looking at things or defining them. So this is an example of yet another person defining what is poetry for us. I hope this was useful to you. Let me know what you think and I will continue producing these videos on my AP English class on poetry, prose and other aspects of the class. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Be generous to each other. And I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.